Okay, welcome as you guys are joining. Um, why don't you post in the chat where you're joining us from? This will be a, a nice, uh, small, intimate group. Um, and I'm really excited today that we've got uh, Virginia O'Brien with us. I'm, I'm sure she needs no introduction, but I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about um, Virginia. And what we're doing today is really just a conversation um, about her career, how she evolved her career. So having said that, um, Dr. O'Brien is active in clinical research. She's presented on the topic of dynamic thumb uh, stability, both nationally and internationally. She's also involved in a lot of different educational um, workshops on many different topics related to the upper limb. She's published in Hand, Journal of Pan Therapy, and also since 2012 um, in the Yearbook of Hand and Upper Limb Surgery. She's uh, active still in clinical and biomechanical uh, research. She's also involved, uh, you know, full time in clinical care. Um, and so I'm really grateful that you've, um, with as busy as you are, uh, made time for this conversation. I really appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, so, so what I wanted to just start uh, with is really the start of your career. What what led you to I guess, first occupational therapy and then ultimately hand therapy. Well, the choice for occupational therapy uh, first as a junior in high school, no idea what OT was. Um, so I went to a job fair at high school and um, they said, well, you can visit one of the hospitals in town. Um, interestingly, it was this town. I went to a school in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and um, visit, visited, they said, well, why don't you visit both physical therapy and occupational therapy? And so I visited the PT clinic and, um, it was a lot of exercise and a lot of the, the big gym. And I just realized this is way back in the seventies. Um, and then when that finished, I went over to the OT clinic and there was a weaving loom. There was a carpenter carpentry set up shop. Um, people were doing crafts, people were making splints and I went, that's what I want to do. <laughs> I do not want to do PT. PT just sounded too boring to me. Um, because it, it was just important to me to have fun when I'm doing, um, when I'm working. And so that's, that started my career in OT or at least to pursue it. Okay. And then, and OT is very broad. So then what, uh, moved you towards hand therapy. Did you start in hand therapy? What, what did that well, look like? Um, actually, hand therapy had probably not truly begun. Um, I, I will date myself. I graduated in 1976 from my university, University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, so I um, it, OT there was general OT. You did pediatrics, you did hip fractures, you did um, burns. We had it. This is a burn center here. Um, so you just did everyone. And I had a really wonderful uh, student supervisor, as we call them now, they're called CIs, um, who totally knew about splinting. Um, we even called it orth orthotics. Mm -hmm. um, and she taught me the principles of really good splinting. And that fed into my crafting penchant that I have. Um, and then I also had to make um, splints for those in the, in the burns uh, unit. And um, that was a challenge. Um, but because I was taught the early principles of all the arches of the hand, that just fascinated me about the architecture of the hand. And so that started my, my thinking and I moved on to regular general OT working in nursing homes and we might got married and then we moved to um, the twin cities of Minnesota and um, started out in just general, general OT. Um, but it wasn't until after I am mean, still that, um, the architecture of the hand was always fun. So I, I was the splinting guru wherever I went. And so I was the one that they said, oh, there's a really tough uh, hand that needs to be splinted. And I remember if some of you, if you, Mariella, may know um, 
uh, aqua form, not aqua, yeah. not aqua plus aqua form, uh, like really mm-hmm. limp. And I made a spastic cone webbed splint on a, on or for a spastic, spastic hand. I mean, if I can do that with uh, aqua, it was aqua form, polyform. Oh, oh, even polyform. worse. <laughs> even <Yes. laughs> worse. Very, very limp. Um, so that I, I, I did it. And it wasn't until after I had my children, um, I stayed home for a bit. And I had a friend who I had met when I was working with the nursing home uh, OT contract uh, business. And she said, well, I've met this person who's now working with some hand surgeons. Do you want to come and learn about hand therapy? And that was um, about 1983 or so. And so I figured as long as I'm going to be underneath her tutelage, she, I, I trusted her very much. And so with our relationship, then she um, so I got my hands in iontophoresis and just working with hand surgeons because hand, I, I didn't know about the hand therapy society until even 1986, I don't think. Um, mm-hmm. but then she, she progressed in her career to more hand therapy, knew somebody in the twin cities who then hired me in at the Fairview hand center in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And that I, I stayed with Fairview Hand Center for 27 years before I moved to back to Madison. So it was just, you know, it's it's who you meet, where you work, who you never know what are your right. connections. Um, but it was, I think because I was using my skills and I love to make splints that that really helped me to move forward in understanding more and more about the hand, um, the hand and doing hand therapy. So then being in that role, because this was also years then after you had graduated, how did you develop the knowledge needed to be able to, you know, provide that optimal care, given that it's, you know, focused within more of a biomechanical model, so heavily dependent on our knowledge of anatomy, understanding healing timelines, not a top-down approach. Right. How did you how did you meet that n- need? Well, I knew I knew I didn't know very much. I knew more about the general body, but not as much about the hand. But I had a penchant to want to know, um, so I knew I couldn't do it alone. So working with others, um, I learned a lot working alongside others, and then um, we began some hand therapy study groups. And that was really important and sort of in the late, uh, late eighties and early nineties, more and more of those hand therapy study groups would happen. And we would sit and, uh, devour articles and, and the rehab of the hand was out by that time. And so we would, uh, talk about some of the, um, chapters and review those, um, so it just kept moving forward. I remember I set a, a life, you know, I, we had a splinting workshop um, and the representative said, I want you guys to write a five-year goal. And this was 1992. Okay. And um, so I said, well, in five years, I'm going to be um, a certified hand therapist. So 1992. Well, 1996 came along and there were um, opportunities to work um, to cover up the pregnancy, um, then an opportunity to sit for, um, to to work full time at this Fairview Hand Center in Minneapolis. And with the caveat, she said, but you have to sit for the CHT exam this year. So it was one year before my five-year goal of 1998 to sit for the exam. So I did, and I passed in 1997. So I wasn't in the first class. And do you feel your OT education gave you the needed foundational knowledge as you started working within that area, the anatomy? You talked about, you know, learning about the hand. I was um, really blessed to be at a university that had a fabulous anatomy class. It was a good six credit course. Um, so we we did do some 
uh, in, in the hand, but definitely a lot of what I learned was on the jobs, um, extra reading, extra studying, and then working full time. I had the opportunity to work with hand surgeons Mm -hmm. who then would bring people to you and say, okay, you're going to make a splint for this person. And I had to be on the ready to figure out what's the diagnosis. What do I do? How do I do it? And, um, perform for the, the hand surgeon. So, and do, I mean, perform, that sounds terrible, but the, um, be able to provide the best care and the Mm -hmm. best support for this person. But it definitely took a lot of on the side learning because OT can't teach you OT education can't teach you the specifics for all the specialties. It really does take um, specialty training. Right, and I think that's why we're seeing the evolution of all of these fellowships for different Mm -hmm. specialties, not just hands, which I think is a great um, thing to fill knowledge gaps for therapists that are educated at that generous lo- generalist level, whether they want to do pediatrics or they just have all of these different, right. um, I think they call them residency programs. Um, so I think that that's a great um, mm-hmm. avenue for people. So have you noticed any trends then when, when you, cause you're working clinically, you have therapists that are probably new grads um, starting in your hand clinic. Have you noticed any trends with regards to clinical readiness um, in hand therapy? Um, I, because, uh, in here in Madison, we have had some really wonderful opportunities to speak with our, um, our schools here. And then when I was in Minnesota, they, they now have, at least in university of Minnesota, they have a PTC, I mean, an OTCHT, um, PhD, Corey McGee, who, um, make sure that the OTs there understand about um, PAMS and orthotic fabrication and the architecture of the hand as part of their general um, program. But there definitely have been some students that have come through now that I've been in Madison that don't have that education. And the, we we have um, a really good um level two educational program so that they with extra PowerPoints that the student is required to watch and learn. Uh, I know that was uh, very, very important when I was a student supervisor and I wrote a student supervisor um, manual. And when people wanted to come and do a third uh, level um, or third rotation in hands, we expected a lot from them and we actually started doing an interview and had them make um, some more orthoses so we could really understand their fabrication skill um, yeah. as well. Because we we felt you couldn't just take anyone. Um, right. And I feel very sad that AOTA has decided that hand is a FISDIS um, uh, rotation because you'd still need the general rotation of, mm-hmm. uh, in physical disabilities uh, and hand is a specialty. Right. And so I am very, very strongly believing that you, you need your basis in OT mm-hmm. before you move into a specialty. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I would agree. Um, so with regards to um, qualities that would be essential for someone to uh, be successful in a hand therapy clinic? Can you just touch on those? Um, it's really important that you understand the anatomy. Um, general anatomy is really important in how the upper extremity is based in the shoulder, based in the spine, based in the neck. You've got to understand the basis of the hand, but the hand, the the elbow and the forearm and the wrist and the hand are so incredibly unique. Um, and it's a lot of information. And so you, um, one needs to make sure that they understand the anatomy, understand the relationships of the anatomy to e- the, the anatomy to each other and how they influence the other. The whole. Yeah. The whole. 
How did you um, kind of get honed in on the thumb CMC joint? Um, I know you have a therapist as well, but I know you've done yeah, a lot. I, yeah, I, I, I love working on the thumb. Um, and it's so fun to see people um, within two or three visits and they already have a significant amount, a less, less amount of pain. How did I get involved in it? Well, because I was connected to a really good hand therapy um, group in Minneapolis, Jan Albrecht was um, a, she, she lived south of the Twin Cities near the near the Iowa border, but um, she herself uh, trained, she herself was a mental health therapist, a general OT. And then after she raised her kid, she decided I, I wanna learn more and she learned about hand therapy. So she went to Mayo to learn about hand therapy. But then she herself developed um, significant CMC OA. And she was working with the uh, um, PTs, uh, PTCHDs and the OTs at Mayo, as well as another uh, hospital system in the Minneapolis area. And it was one of the PTCHTs that, because um, Jan tried ultrasound and she tried paraffin and she tried splints and nothing was working for her. Um, so it was a Julie Liebelt, who is a PTCHT out of Minneapolis. Um, she was reading Dr. Brand's um, in book and about the first dorsal interosseus, and she went, hmm, this looks really interesting. Why don't we try this for you, Jan? And that was the key for her. She began to work with the first, or, first dorsal interosseus on her own hand because she was an OT. She understood and that was a game changer for her. So she is a was a photographer. She passed away in 16, sadly. Um, a, a wonderful photographer and loved to teach, being a, a good OT. And so that's when she started putting together some um, handouts. And then it evolved into her first book and um, to train other people. So she came to Fairview Hand Center in Minneapolis and taught us in 2000 about the dynamic stability of the program of the thumb. And then mm -hmm. uh, we adopted that program as a, um, as a department and it was really having wonderful success. Um, so that's where I first learned about it. And then when I went to get my doctorate um, in 2010, I had to have a project to finish. And I thought, well, we've been doing the dynamic stability of the thumb. We have been, we have, we had been doing the quick dash. We had just moved into doing the quick dash um, as an outcome tool. And so in my OTD studies, I learned, well, that's pretty important to have something that's reliable, valid, and shows um, change over time. So let's see if we do a retrospective study, will this show any difference? And we were just incredibly amazed um, about the, the, the um, st statistically important difference in pain and in function that even though it was a very small 35 people by the time I cut it down from 335 charts to 35, um, but it still showed significant uh, a significant difference. And that's been the basis for other research that I've done and other research that has um, just exploded since then. So would you say then then the bulk of your research was kind of um, initiated through doing your OTD? That that kind Very of much so. Yeah, I didn't um, understand much about research. I, I had a bachelor's um, degree, didn't know how to do research. And the whole reason I went to get my OTD was I was the supervisor over PT and hand therapy at this clinic I was working, where I was working, and um, went to, I th there was a research seminar day at uh, the Philadelphia Hand Center, or a Philadelphia mm -hmm. Hand Meeting. Mm -hmm. I thought, I'll go learn about research in that one-day seminar. Well, it had Paul Esteo, um, Ken Flowers, Jane Fedorczyk, Joy McDermott, a couple other people, all the big wigs that I sort of knew, but now I know how, how big they were. And they were just firing at me 
um, words and discussion that was just like trying to take a drink out of a fire hydrant. I didn't understand it. So I, what was happening was we were having a lot of PTs coming out as DPTs. I thought, well, I have to be a good supervisor and um, support their research because they are OTDs, right? Mm -hmm. So when I realized I couldn't even understand research myself, when I got home from that um, Philadelphia hand meeting, there was a card postcard in my mailbox when I got home that at Rocky Mountain University of Health Professions, they were doing an OTD program with a hand emphasis. And it was Joy, um, excuse me, Sue Michaelvich. She, she also yes. was in that crew. So um, I didn't think twice. I signed up for it. I thought, I, I don't want to get any other kind of healthcare advanced degree other than an OTD, better than an, a PhD, a little easier for me. And mm -hmm. um, that helped me to understand research, helped me to understand how important it is to get uh, information into our literature. And I thought if, if I can end my career by helping to get more literature that supports what we do because we're ot's we're so codependent we think well of course we make people better but if you don't have it in the literature it doesn't hold water with your insurance coverage insurance mm -hmm. um people so your payers so it was important to me to work to get information into the literature um so that we could show what we do makes a difference mm -hmm. Have you noticed any changes with um, OT, OT education in general? Um, and I guess like the foundational knowledge focus, like if that has altered at all through the years, because, because OT is so broad and now we're doing these entry, entry level doctoral degrees. I don't know if you've just noticed anything with regards to readiness for um, well, like I a high level of... I think it really depends which university you go to um, yeah, as to your readiness for the focus. I um, I think we, we thought OT school is OT school, but it's not. You need right. to know what are your goals in life and you need to look at the different OTD school or OT yeah. schools. I've had um, really good in, uh, I guess, uh, students, I'm, gonna say, I'm not gonna say luck, but, um, the right now I have a fellow because I started another fellowship here in Madison after I had started mm -hmm. the one in Minnesota. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, um, we have a fellow right now, he's an OTD student out of uh, Wash U in St. Louis. He is, you know, he, he knows how to read literature. He, that, that's, what's really wonderful. He understands evidence. He knows how to critically appraise papers. And that's, a, that's important to me uh, yes. so that yeah. as they are moving forward in their career, I mean, he still has to learn the basics and hand therapy. And that's, that's still, that's going to be, I still learn. So Ongoing. it's going to be part of, part of your life, but um, having him as a a higher level understanding of literature moving forward with, with his higher level um, of understanding, we can move even farther with what we want to teach. And uh, we have a couple of capstone students um, working with another program within our upper extremity uh, rehab department, and they're working on lymphedema, but their knowledge base is really wonderful. They know how to do literature reviews. They know how to critically appraise those papers. They they know how to put together a sentence and they know how to put together a paper. And I think mm -hmm. that's what's um, helped to elevate um, the profession of occupational therapy. So I, I'm highly um, supportive of the OTD program. One yeah. of the things that um, Paula Steo told me just in that research seminar that I went to. Um, and I'm not sure if he told, he wasn't telling me, but it was the group. He said, one of the reasons that OT doesn't have enough literature is because you don't have a lot of doctorates in your profession. And that was just a light bulb that went mm -hmm. off in, 
in my head if I wanted to do anything to make a difference in my career and show that what I do is evidence as evidence for other people to be able to do the same, Mm -hmm. then I need to get my doctorate. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I did. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say that was before I even knew that there was a doctoral program for OT. So that was back in 2010. Yeah. I mean, I, I did do my doctoral degree, but it was because I already had done Jane Fedorsik's program Mm -hmm. upper limit hand. And I knew I could roll those credits in to a, mm-hmm. a doctoral degree. And I thought the same thing as you, I was the director of hand therapy. I knew that PTs were, you know, they were all um, doctoral level PTs. Mm-hmm. And I wasn't exactly sure, you know, what I would get out of uh, the doctoral program, but I, it was, it added so much value. Um, oh, to my so career. much value. Yeah. Yeah. So Very I agree. Much. I also think it's uh, worthwhile if you, ha- if you have those interests, I guess you definitely have to be, um, interested, motivated, and, and just be in a position where you can, um, put the time towards it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's not, um, not easy to do research. It's always on your own time. Um, it's rare that you can have anybody, any facility pay for your research, but you have to have a penchant. You have to have a, a strong desire to say, While she's frozen, if you guys have questions, um, go ahead and put them in the chat. Um, you could probably also unmute yourself. Hopefully um, her her uh, video resolves here. We'll just give her a minute. But does anyone have any questions while we're waiting for her uh, video? And if you want, if you want it to be about um, her um, expertise, I think that's fine. We lost you just for a minute. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. Um, so since we only have a couple minutes, I, I was asking the group if they had any questions um, for you. I'm not seeing anything uh, in the chat. Oh, there's somebody oh, from hi, England. Um, hi, Virginia, it's nice to meet you over Zoom. Okay. Um, I'm from South Africa. I finished the fellowship with Marilla about, I think it's now two years ago. Um, mm-hmm. but I'm doing my master's now in hand therapy here in South Africa. And it's it's not really a question. I just wanted to say I also have, uh, I love uh, sore thumb and uh, treating painful thumbs. And I'm also doing my master's now in CMC08 um, to, to look at that. So, <laughs> so yes, it's, it's, it's nice to meet you and been reading lots of your articles and um, working through them. So it's, it's cool. It, Great to put a uh, face to the name. Oh well, thank you so much, Ingrid. I appreciate that. <laughs> one of one of the other author authors that I think is really wonderful to read after is Raquel Telez Cantares. Yes, um, she has done wonderful work with the proprioceptive input um, of the thumb and marrying that with um, dynamic stability of the thumb. Which you know you you can't move the motor unless you have sensory, and you can't can't have sensory without the motor. So that is absolutely wonderful. So it'd be exciting to see what comes out. Looking specifically at proprioception after uh, CMC surgery. So there's not been much research post off. Exactly. Lots of lots of it has been done before surgery, but um, and then everyone goes for surgery, but no one knows what happens to the patients. So I'm looking specifically at post op and hopefully at proprioception post-op. Oh, wonderful. Yeah, one of the Mm -hmm. things that I've noticed, I know we're right at 12 o'clock, but one of the things I've noticed that for those CMC arthroplasty patients, well, a piece of kinesio tape that bridges the gap where it goes from the P1, you know, the tip of the thumb to the proximal phalanx to the metacarpal, and then it's space, and then you get to the carpus. If you, you can bridge that gap with kinesio tape, they have a little better proprioception. So you might want to try that. I'll definitely try that. Thank you. Okay, well, I want to just thank everyone for joining us, but especially Virginia, thank you so much for your time um, and just sharing your insights with us. It's very much appreciated. Um, And thanks uh, for all of you that joined. Since it's uh, one o'clock, I want to respect everyone's time.
Um, so we'll end there and, and uh, I will have this as a recording. Um, so you can look for that um, at the very least on the uh, YouTube page, you can find that. So thanks again, everyone. Have a great afternoon or evening. Thanks, Virginia.